Today's lecture will focus on Chapter 28, The Formation and Termination of Corporations. As you know by now, corporations are artificial people. They're intangibles. So the corporation is a separate entity, separate and distinct from its owners. So thus, corporations can hold its own property. They can convey its own property. Corporations can be sued. And they can make bylaws that govern how they conduct their business. <coughs> there are three main classifications of corporations. However, we're going to talk about for-profit corporations for the bulk of this chapter. But let me talk about government corporations and non-profit -corp non corporations first. A government corporation, also known as a municipal corporation, is a corporation that's, in essence, run by the government. A non-profit corporation is a corporation who still makes profits but doesn't have to pay taxes on their profits. So both government corporations and nonprofit corporations do not have to pay a corporate income tax. The bulk of this chapter, we're going to focus on for-profit corporations. They are by far the most common type of corporation, and their goal is to make a profit for its owners, known as shareholders. The shareholders can buy in and can sell stock. All for-profit corporations are either publicly held corporations or private or closely held corporations. A publicly held corporation is one that issues stocks to the general public, whereas a private or course closely held corporation have a limited amount of shareholders and they do not, and shares are not necessarily open to the public. For the first part of today's lecture, we're going to talk about publicly held corporations. And then at the end of today's lecture, we'll talk about private or closely held corporations. Let's start with publicly held corporations. Corporations are regulated under the Model Business Corporations Act, or the MBCA. Remember, corporation is an artificial entity, so someone has to bring the corporation into existence. This is known as the pre-incorporation process. A promoter is the person who brings the corporation into its existence. Promoters are not agents of the corporation because there was no corporation yet in existence. However, promoters do have a fiduciary duty to both the corporation that will come into existence <coughs> and people who are interested in the corporation. Promoters also have liabilities to third parties before the corporation comes into existence. After the corporation comes into existence, promoters may not be liable if there's a novation between the promoter, the corporation, and the third party. Now, once the corporation comes into existence, what liability does the corporation have? Let's look at first to the promoter. The corporation is not required to pay promoters for services rendered during the pre-incorporation process. After, corp after the corporation has come into existence, the corporation may pay or issue stock to the promoter. In addition, the corporation does not have any liability to a third party during the pre-incorporation statute because it hasn't been in existence. Unless the board of directors moves to adopt the pre-incorporation contract between the promoter and the third party, or there's a novation. This is a really good slide in terms of understanding both liability from a promoter perspective and a corporation perspective. Take a few minutes to look at this. So up till now, we've talked about pre-incorporation. Now let's talk about how corporations incorporate or come into being. being. So again, state law will dictate how corporations derive their existence, not federal law. So businesses can incorporate by preparing what's called the Articles of Incorporation, otherwise known as the Charter, as required by the state for which they choose to incorporate. Delaware and Ohio are very common states to incorporate because they have corporate laws that are very favorable. 
However, a corporation can be formed in any state. <coughs> what are the steps in incorporation under the NBCA? Well, the first thing to do is to prepare the Articles of Incorporation, otherwise known as the Charter. Once that's done, one of the, pre one of the incorporators must sign the Articles. Then the Articles must be filed with the applicable Secretary of State and any fees that must be paid. Once that's done, the Secretary of State will issue a Certificate of Incorporation. And once that's done, you should hold the first organizational meeting of the corporation. So the first step, prepare the Articles of Incorporation. There are certain things that must be in the Articles of Incorporation, and there are certain things that are optional but really should be in there. Mandatory is the name, the number of shares, and the address of the office, as well as the registered agent, and the name and address of each incorporator. Things that are optional, but I would say you should still have there, is the duration of the corporation, which is usually perpetual or forever. The purpose of the corporation, and usually that's broadly stated as any lawful activity to allow the corporation to do anything as much as possible that's legal. The par value of the shares, the number and names of the initial board of directors, and any additional provisions. So who can incorporate? Generally, you have to have three natural adult people, but the MBCA is relaxed as required, say one person can incorporate. So then once you incorporate, you gotta you know, pay the fees and then the Secretary of State will give you the certificate showing that you complied with all legal requirements and then you hold your first organizational meeting, usually done by the board of directors or the board of directors will be appointed at that first organizational meeting. And generally, corporations adopt a seal Usually during that first meeting, the board of directors will establish what's called bylaws. Bylaws simply are the internal rules that the corporation will abide by. Bylaws do not have to be published with the Secretary of State, whereas the Articles of Incorporation are for public viewing. Bylaws are internal rules and thus are not made. Uh, the public does not have a right to see them. <clears throat> Corporations often have to fall historically with what's called ultra vies, which was a it, which was a term that's in Latin, which says that a transaction that was beyond the corporation's boards or corporation's powers based on either the Articles of Incorporation or state laws where they were incorporation. Thus, if you did anything that violated that, the transaction was void. And traditionally, corporations would use this ultra-vised doctrine to avoid a contract that looked unattractive because of change of conditions. However, modernly, the NBCA eliminated ultra-vised as a defense for the enforcement of a contract. So, problems exist when a corporation was defective during the process because one of the things we know about corporations is that its owners or shareholders have limited liability. So it's imperative that the corporation is properly filed and it's not defective. Most states fall what's known as the old MBCA rule and holds states that the issuance of a certificate of incorporation by a state is thus conclusive proof of incorporation. However, the revised NBCA clarifies joint and several liability for business debts after a defective incorporation. I'll come back to this slide in a second. What I do want you to know for your test is a historical references of attempts to incorporate that go wrong. And I want to introduce you to a couple terms, de jure, de facto, and estoppel. A de jure corporation is when the promoters of the corporation substantially complied with all mandatory provisions. Thus, the corporation's in good graces or it's de jure. A de facto corporation is when 
the incorporators made an honest attempt, but a faulty attempt to comply with the mandatory provisions of the corporation statute. The corporation still now cannot deny its existence because they did made an honest but failed attempt. Where we get into problems historically is known as a corporation by estoppel. That's when individuals hold themselves out as corporations without any attempt to comply with the state's incorporation statutes. Courts will not allow parties to a contract to avoid liability if there's corporation by estoppel. So again, the slide that you're looking at right now is a good way to look at both the old and revised Model Business Corporations Act, the modern approach as well on the left, as well as the historical approach of de jure, de facto, incorporation by estoppel on the right. Now, as stated, one of the benefits for owners of a corporation is the fact that owners have limited liability, which means the most that they could lose is the amount that they've invested into the corporation. This concept is known as the corporate veil. The veil is, in essence, a liability shield between the owners and the corporation. However, there's a concept that you should know about, which is known as piercing the corporate veil. When the corporate veil is pierced, in essence, the veil goes down, and now the shareholders or owners are subject to unlimited personal liability. So oftentimes creditors try to persuade the court to quote unquote pierce the corporate veil and hold the shareholders liable. Usually this will happen in two ways, either through undercapitalization, if they can show that the shareholders did not put enough money or capital into the business, or if it's under the notion of alter ego, when the shareholders mix their personal dealings with corporate transactions. Were there the requirements to pierce the corporate veil? There are three of them. The first one is when one or more shareholders dominate the corporation. Second, that domination results in an improper pur purpose. And as long as it's allowed by applicable state statute. Here's a good visual representation of piercing of the corporate veil. Up till now, we've talked about publicly held corporations or corporations that sell shares of stock to any member of the public. For the duration of today's class, we're gonna talk about closely held corporations or private corporations. In fact, most businesses in the United States that, are, that have been incorporated are closely held. These are mom and pop shops. So what are common traits of closely held corporations? Remember, we're no longer talking about publicly held corporations. Well, common traits is one, fewer shareholders. Two, they may live and work, know each other. Usually all, if not most all of the shareholders are active in management of the business. And fourth and most importantly, there's no established market for the stock because it's privately or closely held. The problem is, is that the corporate statutes for each state are more modeled towards publicly held corporations as opposed to closely or privately held corporations. And so, as you can see, states have enacted laws recognizing the importance of closely held corporations and special protections that it needs. So there are three concepts you should understand with regards to the transfer transferability of shares in a closely held corporation. The first restriction is known as the right of first refusal. Under this concept, either the corporation or shareholders are given the first right to buy shares if additional shares are offered to sale. We do this in order to maintain a balance of power in a closely held corporation, and it keeps unwanted people from buying shares. The second restriction with regards to transferability of shares is what's known as a buy-sell agreement. Under this, it guarantees that a shareholder receives the value of their investment upon either their death or retirement. So thus, 
the shareholder is required to sell and the corporation is obliged to purchase shares at an agreed upon price. The final restriction regarding the transferability of shares is known as a consent restraint. This is a way of keeping unwanted people out of the closely held corporation. Thus, a consent restraint is an agreement whereby a seller of shares must get the permission of the board of directors or the shareholders for any sale of shares other than to the corporation or to other shareholders on a pro rata basis. So oftentimes there may be governance issues with regards to closely held corporations. So usually you may have a majority shareholder and sometimes minority shareholders of closely held corporations are frozen out. When this happens, the courts may intervene to protect the rights of minority shareholders in conflicts if certain, if certain conditions are met, which you can see on this slide. Finally, how are closely held corporations terminated? Well, it can be in a couple of different ways. It can be voluntary, such as by a dissolution of agreement. And here the corporation needs the consent of the state to dissolve. So when all the shareholders of the closely held corporation decide to dissolve, you can do this. Or it can be done through what's known as an involuntary dissolution of a corporation. This is when it's not voluntary, but the court in, instead orders the corporation to be dissolved for such reasons as failure to pay their corporate taxes or the failure to uh, provide an annual report or if certain shareholders request it or it, it appears that the cor closely held corporation is facing insolvency. This concludes our lecture on Chapter 28, How Corporations Are Formed and Terminated.